Okay, so we're going to talk about the kinetic theory of gases. And it's kind of an interesting topic because this is what really convinced people like Einstein and others that quantum mechanics was a thing. So if you think back in the fall semester, quantum mechanics really helped describe spectroscopic phenomena. So how light interacts with matter. And they were worried that it was just a trick, right? Like an ad hoc solution. So is it really telling us about nature or is it just a, a funny way to think about the problem that answers some of the spectroscopic questions? Thermodynamics was king. So, uh, I mean, the whole industrial revolution was based upon a steam engine. We knew thermodynamics really well. And so Boltzmann was able to use this kind of quantized energy math to solve some of the thermodynamic problems like the velocity of gases. And so this is really Boltzmann's work. And then Planck used Boltzmann's equation to solve the, um, the uh, black body radiation problem. And they thought, well, maybe that was just luck. <laughs> I mean, they didn't really, they weren't convinced yet, but then the statistical mechanics and, and explaining all the thermodynamic properties, Boltzmann comes in and it describes entropy and all of these things. And that, that's really what convinced them that thermodynamics was also explainable with quantum theory. And it started with the kinetic theory of gases. So this is a, just a classic topic in, in science. It's really easy to think about though, conceptually. Think of a baseball flying through the air from physics one. You know, what is the velocity, the kinetic uh, energy of that, of that particle flying through space? And that's one half mv squared. And so the equipartition of energy of the translating particle would be three halves RT, you know, one half RT for all three directions of uh, travel. And so we could set these equal to each other. And now we have the connection of temperature to velocity and its mass dependence. And so that's, that's it. <laughs> now there's a lot of other math be the behind the scenes in terms of collision frequencies and so on. And we'll see some of those equations today, but in terms of the velocity related to temperature, this is it. It's the energy, the kinetic energy of the particle and the equipartition energy of the particle, that internal energy of the particle and how it depends upon temperature. You set those equal to each other, the one halves cancel, and you can solve for the velocity of the particle based on temperature or based on mass. And so that tells you if you heat the substance up, it's going to be traveling faster and have a higher velocity cool things down, gas molecules slow down. So really the velocity of a particle is its temperature in terms of a gas. And so rearranging this, this actually is the root mean squared velocity. We'll see what the differences are for those. Um, and then also a fusion, this is a way to measure and verify this, this treatment. And that is a fusion of a gas through a pinhole. So if you have a, a lot of gas, and you have a, a barrier and a pinhole and the gas molecules flow through that pinhole, you could measure the increase in pressure on this side and count the particles essentially. And that's going to, that's Graham's law says that's proportional to this root mean squared velocity. Now, if we wanted to actually measure the velocities of the gases, we can do that. Um, oh, and, and just, to make sure that you understand the difference in terms. This, what we're talking about here is effusion through a pinhole. It's escape of gas molecules through a hole into an evacuated space. And that's what's proportional to the root mean squared velocity. Okay, it's not diffusion. So they sound very similar, but I'm, uh, try to, I try to emphasize the D when I'm saying diffusion and, and of course not when it's effusion. So diffusion is covered on Monday. So when we come back, we'll talk about diffusion. So this is how we measure the velocities of the, of the molecules. Okay, so we, we have this thing called a Knudsen cell. And it's really, really simple. It's just a, a big iron block that you heat up and you put your sample in it and it's got a little hole or a slit in it. And if you put it in contact with a vacuum, 
whatever vapor pressure that substance has at that temperature, those little molecules or atoms come off the surface of the hot object and fly through the hole and go into the vacuum chamber. And so it's just a way to con con make a molecular beam. And sometimes these are called molecular beam experiments because there's a beam of molecules going into a vacuum. Okay. And you can control the, the, the amount and the speed of the uh, particles by just changing the temperature. Okay, so we get this going, we get a beam going, we have a set temperature for this Knudsen cell. Um, we set the temperature so that we detect very easily the, the molecules hitting the other wall. So we have the detector down here. And then we can put this mass filter, or velocity filter, I should say, in the, in the way. So here's our detector. Um, uh, you know, it's, um, it's kind of like a photomultiplier tube. Um, whereas you've got it charged, and then if something hits the surface, then it knocks electrons off, and then they go downhill and, and you know, create enough of a signal that we can detect. So we can count individual strikes of an atom or a molecule. And then we have this motor and these, these rotating slits. And so in this example, see how fast the green track is? It went through the first slit and then hit the wall. Okay, that's because the motor's turning too slowly. And so this, this beam is going, this particular atom is going too fast to get through the slit. But what if we had a big, you know, one that, you know, you got a distribution of velocities coming out of this oven. What if a slow one passed through? So it passed through and it's only right here at this point in time. And this motor's turning at a particular frequency. And so by the time this particle reaches this spot, that slit may be lined up and then it makes it through and hits the detector. So this is a velocity filter. And so you just, you start at a slow velocity and only the slow atoms are detected. And then you speed it up and then you detect the next band of speeds and then you speed it up faster and faster and faster when it's going really fast then the slow ones go through but they don't go through the second slit because the slit's already gone by and they hit the wall so it can filter a, a band of velocities that's with the speed of the of the motor pretty cool experiment and this is the data that you get out of it so you get this curve of molecular speeds it's pretty neat okay so when the when the motor was turning slowly you know, we were able to detect this band here. Then when it was turning a little faster, we were detecting this band here. And then when the motor is turning really fast, we detect these up here. And so we can get that, that curve out of that experiment. Then we can change the, the temperature of the oven. We can cool it down or, or heat it up and we get a different curve. So we could, we could verify the math that, uh, that uh, Boltzmann did in terms of this equilibrium velocities. So he used, he derived this curve using quantized energies, again, as a simple starting point. He introduced the concept of quantized energy, but he didn't believe at that point that it was representative of nature. He said, this would just make the math easier. So we'll start there as a starting point. And then Planck is the one that really applied that math to the black body radiation curve. Notice this also, um, you can draw on here sort of like a something that's related to the vapor pressure, okay? So if, let's just say right here, if this is enough energy for the molecules to be in the vapor phase, notice at zero degrees C, there's a few molecules and every, every solution, there's gonna be some molecules that have enough energy to leave the surface, right? And then other, uh, at higher temperatures, you have many more molecules. And so that's what that clausius clapeyron equation is telling us, that the vapor, the pressure above a liquid, um, it's not really this curve, but it's similar. And, and you can kind of think of that as, as, as all of the, the distribution moves to, to higher speeds because it's at higher energy. And then above a certain threshold, like escape from the surface, you're gonna have more molecules with that energy. So this is a curve that you really should at least conceptually have in your mind, that at any temperature, you've got some molecules that are really cold, some molecules that are really hot, and then some average in the middle. Okay. Okay, and so then we're following this root mean squared velocity. Notice 
that if we raise the temperature, it's not a linear dependence. It's a square root dependence. And so in order to, uh, you know, I love to ask these questions because I might say if you've got, um, you know, uh, a, let's see, an atom at T1 is traveling at V1 what is this V RMS um, at T2 I haven't told you what what the mass of the atom is so you can't just solve the problem directly but this is my favorite kinds of problems as you know and so you do the ones and twos, right? You have V1 over V2 is equal to this whole thing, 3RT1 over M1 divided by 3RT2 over M2. So you can always set this up. When you have two situations, use ones and twos to keep track of your situations. And this will keep you from making a mistake of thinking it's linear. It's got a square root dependence. And so this way you can see that there's a square root dependence. The mass of the particle hasn't changed. The three hasn't changed. The gas constant hasn't changed. And so this is how velocity and temperature are related to each other. It's proportional to the square root of temperature. So we can solve for V2 like this. Uh, V2 is equal to V1 times the square root of, uh, let's see, so V2 comes over on the right, T2 comes over on the left on top, over T1 to the one half. Does everybody follow the math? I move my temperatures over to the left to be with the V1 and V2 over on the right, and then I swapped it on the other side of the equal sign. So. Okay, and so that's how you would solve that problem. And that's, again, that's my favorite kind of problem because a lot of times you don't have all the information you need. So you've got situation one and you change one thing, how does the situation two shake out? Okay. So let's look at what happens with, uh, with different masses. You can see these different distributions So with the, the heaviest atom in, or molecule in this series, oxygen with 32 grams per mole, you see it's really a slow molecule at a given temperature. So all these are at the same temperature. Okay, so all these are at the same temperature and so you can see the mass effect. So hydrogen being the lightest atom, again, that's in the denominator, mass down here. And, uh, and so you have the, the largest root mean squared velocity. It's kind of, kind of pointing at the root mean squared velocity, those little arrows. It's a single number that characterizes the distribution. And so what we're actually calculating with this equation is that dot. We're not calculating the distribution, but that dot represents the distribution. So if the distribution is spread out to higher numbers, that dot's going to be the highest number. Does everybody follow that? And so here's the other velocity moments. So a moment, what is a moment? Well, these are single numbers that represent a distribution. That would be the simplest definition of the word moment in these cases. And look at this curve. So the, the top one in the curve, okay, this top number is going to be the, the most probable. So MP stands for most probable. And then we talk about the average. So that would be the, the average velocity. 
and then the root mean squared velocity is the RMS. Why do we care about the average or the RMS? Notice this particular curve, this type of curve is not symmetric. It's, it tails to the right. And so how do we sort of capture that, that um, a lot of the molecules have a higher velocity? Well, we have these other, these other metrics, the average or the root mean squared. They, they sort of are higher than the most probable. And that's trying to capture the fact that we have a tail distribution. So that's, that's why we would use the RMS value. It's a little bit more representative because it takes into account these higher velocities that we see on this tail. Um, the average is intermediate between that. Notice these are the three equations, 2RT over M, 8RT over pi M, or 3RT over M. And 8 over pi is about 2.5, 2.54 something or other. So you see it's 2, 2.5, and, and 3 for the different moments that we have. There's some homework questions that ask you what, you know, the ordering of these. And so um, eight over pi is in there, but, you know, and mentally it's like two and a half. So you could look at those and easily remember the order of them. Uh, you're also, I think, in the, on the homework asked to convert from one to the other. And so if you've got one, you got the other, you can solve all of these. Notice they have sort of a constant value buried in them, the RT over M. And so you could, uh, you could break those apart and, um, and if you've got one, you can solve for the other. Now let's talk about this concept of mean free path. So this was fought against this whole way of thinking. Uh, and I think it's part of what drove Boltzmann to his death uh, because he was, a, he was actually a um, person who believed in, in particles, like that nature was particulate, okay? The prevailing belief, the scientific consensus, if you want to say it that way, was that nature was was smooth, meaning um, like this atmosphere that we're breathing is doesn't have particles in it. It's just like a um, it's hard even to describe because we have particles in our minds, like trying to think about it. like we know it's a gas a gas particle, but they. Their description of like the nucleus and the atom, they thought, well, we know nature's smooth. That was their foundational assumption. And so when they discovered the electron, J.G. Thompson and, and Millikan's experiments discovered discrete electrons, they said, well, maybe they're like plums and pudding. We know nature's like pudding, but we've discovered discrete electrons. And so those are like plums and pudding. So think about uh, pudding, which is smooth. You know, it's not particulate, but then you have discrete things in there like raisins or plums. In the pudding so that was their description of the atom was the plum pudding model that it was a positive pudding and then the negative charges were attracted to this positive pudding so that's the best description i've heard of how what a smooth view of nature would be that it would be like pudding and of course a gas pudding would be you know less dense than solids or liquids it's kind of a weird thing to think about because we've been raised on atoms you know that's the that's been proven to be the case. Um, it's so strange though because these sort of field views of nature are kind of coming back because that's what this idea of this Higgs boson is that it's it's um uh, it's something that goes with mass. Like when trying to describe gravity, they're saying that massive objects attract the Higgs field, and it's the attraction of the Higgs field that drags other masses to masses and that that mathematically gives us gravity. So it's weird that we're kind of coming back to this field view of nature versus a particular view of nature through through gravity. So yeah, I'm out of my depth on that one, but it's fun to think about. So uh, the particulate view would be a, a particle flying through space. What's the probability it's going to hit another particle? And so this is the math of that. Right. Well, if it hits another particle, it's going to bounce that particle off. They're going to exchange energy. This is where we get pressure. It's where we get volume. All of these different physical properties come from these particular views of gas molecules and atoms hitting each other. And one of those concepts is called the mean free path. And it, it depends upon the cross-sectional area. 
of the particular substance. So right here, the area. And that area is made up of radius of particle one and radius of particle two. So are they gonna hit? Well, this particle has a radius, like here, R1. And then this particle has a radius, R2. And you can kind of see that here, R1 plus R2. If those particles are closer than that sum, they're gonna hit somewhere along this path. And if, if they're not, then they won't hit. Now that average distance between the particles is pressure dependent. And so if you wanna have a long mean free path where this particle can go a long distance, you need to really lower the pressure. And this is one of the things we calculate for vacuum systems. So if I'm pumping on the molecules and I want them to make it all the way to my vacuum pump, I want a really long, meat free path. I want those particles to sample the container until they find the exit and then can come out and go out my vacuum pump. It's related to the temperature of the molecules too because I cover a bigger distance if I'm going faster. So here's the math associated with collisional frequency and mean free path. Now I'm just dumping these equations on you because it would take too long to derive them. They're in the Atkins book. You can dig through the math if you're interested. But one thing I want to show you that this would be the collisional frequency for a particle hitting another particle of the same type. Uh, Na is Avogadro's number. Uh, the pressure of particle one, partial, partial pressure of particle one, partial pressure of particle two, um, cross-sectional, that sort of average cross-sectional area, and then the average velocity for the gas at that temperature. And then here's that term, the mean free path is lambda. Okay, that's not on your notes. I added that this morning. So mean free path is lambda, and that's this calculation right here. Now, if we just go with one type of particle, we just have Z, Z11 on the, in the denominator. We have the average velocity on top. Um, it can simplify with this uh, if we break out that average velocity into three, um, let's see, that would be uh, 8 over pi, RT over M. Then it can uh, simplify some things, and we end up with this equation. So let's go ahead and, and calculate that, that uh, mean free path and collisional velocity and, and collisional frequency on, uh, on argon at one atmosphere. So what are the mean free path and collisional frequency for argon gas at one atmosphere and room temperature? So here's our, our lambda equation and here's our cross-sectional area. Now you can, you know, what's the size of an argon atom? Remember in the freshman text, they had the radii of the elements, okay? But most of those are in a solid, like they take, um, iron metal, you know, and you can calculate in a, in, a, in a chunk of iron, you weigh the mass, you've got Avogadro's number, you've got the moles, you can figure out how many atoms there are. And if it's like a cube, you can actually measure it with a micrometer and see what the radius of each of those atoms are. You've got a crystalline substance. But for argon, I mean, how are you gonna do that? Well, you cool it down. You can make an argon ice, you can freeze it. And so you get about 71 picometers for solid argon. Now, if you just have argon condensing on a surface, not close enough to actually make a metal, but close enough to associate and stick, then you get the van der Waals radius. So that'd be 188 picometers. You know, it's more than double. So the van der Waals radius is uh, probably, probably more reasonable to use for the collision path, but People could argue, no, that wouldn't be a hard collision. That would just be a soft collision. As they pass by, they might interact. And so the van der Waals radius is really the interaction distance. And again, atoms are, you know, hard or soft, depending on how close they are. So if they're, if they're pretty distant, 188 picometers apart, they will start to interact. So the van der Waals radius is the interaction radius.
and then the 71 picometers would be the collision radius, I guess. Does that make sense? They start to feel each other at 188 picometers, but when they get to 70, they're starting to crash into each other. So let's use the 71 picometers. I think that's what I use for this 3.6 times 10 to the minus 19 meters squared. And so you can check my math on that one. Um, we've got the temperature, we'll say room temperature, R, gas constant. We'll use joules per mole. We'll convert the pressure over to uh, Pascals um, so we can cancel this, the units in the uh, joules. So this is, again, that's a, um, you know, a, a kilogram meter squared per second squared, and this is a newton per meter squared, so you could calculate. Let me just break those out for you. So this is a kilogram meter squared per second squared and a pascal. I need to write small. Let me write it over here. Pascal is a newton per meter squared, which newton is a force. F equals ma, so it's mass times acceleration. So we just have one of those meters. So it's kilogram, that's your mass, meter per second squared over meter squared. Okay, so the meters, that meter cancels with this exponent. So it's a, it's a yeah, kilogram per meter second squared. And so you can see that cancels everything out with the kilogram meter squared per second squared, except for one of the distances. And so this is going to calculate the final unit will be a distance. The units of uh, per mole will be canceled by Avogadro's number, and then the Kelvin and the denominator of the gas constant will uh, cancel with the temperature. So this whole thing will give us um, will give us a unit of meters. Okay, so then uh, here's the result: 80 nanometers. So that's the mean free path of argon at one atmosphere and room temperature. So think about that. This is the reason I, I do these calculations is it's just almost astonishing that if you're thinking about a gas, so argon in this room at one atmosphere and uh, room temperature is only able to go 80 nanometers before running into another particle. Okay. So let's calculate how often it collides. So this is the collisional frequency. So we put in all of those numbers and we end up with five times 10 to the ninth per second. So it has 5 billion collisions per second. That's incredible. That's in the gas phase. Think about that. I mean, this, this atom is, is not got a lot of time to relax, <laughs> right? It's, and it's bouncing off each other. I mean, that's why if you think about one atmosphere, we're used to moving around in one atmosphere, but think about the pressure it puts on your skin, on your body, on everything. In, in pounds per square inch, it's 14.7 pounds. So next time you're in the fridge or whatever, you're at the store, pick up two gallons of, of milk or two gallons of liquid. Roughly water is eight pounds per gallon. So two gallons is 16 pounds. That's pretty heavy. And 14.7 or 15 pounds per square inch. So a square inch of your body has the pressure of two gallons of liquid on it, just from gas phase collisions. So our atmosphere is just beating us constantly. Thank goodness it's keeping our organs inside our body. <laughs> it's helping, I mean, but we've grown up in this pressurized environment. And that's what's that's what's going on. If if we, um, you know, our diaphragm goes down, creates a slight vacuum, that pressure immediately responds and stuffs air down into our lungs. And if we produce a little bit more pressure than fourteen point seven, then the air flows out. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Okay, now time between collisions. Just take that collision frequency and invert it, and that's then the time between collisions. And so one over five billion is two hundred times 10 to the minus 10, or 200 picoseconds. And so that's how long the argon is going before it hits another, another argon atom. 
So just some just some numbers from the from the um, kinetic theory of gases. So it's a pretty useful theory. Tells us a lot about interactions in the gas phase. Uh, this also tells us um, how fast a reaction can go in the gas phase because this is the collisional frequency. So if you have a gas reaction where the reactants have to collide, it cannot go faster than this. Okay. And so we call those diffusion limited reactions. If it's, you know, it takes a long time for those molecules to reach each other, but as soon as they hit, they react. And so really diffusion, which we'll talk about on Monday, is the limiting factor for a really fast reaction. And it's limited by this velocity of gases. Okay, so that's the last bit of notes here. So I've got the other notes queued up from the um, electrochemistry. So let's talk about ion.